Section 1 of The National Geographic Magazine, Volume 7, March 1896. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaii in March 2016. The so-called Jeannette Relics by Professor William H. Dahl. Much interest has been excited by the recent rumor that news had been received from Nansen via Siberia. In discussing the rumor I mentioned that the supposed relics of the Jeannette found off Julianehaab in Greenland were in all probability in no way connected with the Jeannette expedition, but were due to a boyish prank of some of the members of the Greeley Relief Expedition of 1884. In attempting to formulate his expressions of an interview with me during which the subject was discussed, and which were not revised by me, the reporter unfortunately fell into some inaccuracies, not unnatural in a person unfamiliar with the technicalities of Arctic exploration, but for which the telegrams to the press made me responsible. It seems desirable, therefore, to lay before those interested in such matters a statement of the facts bearing on the two questions involved, namely, were the relics really derived from the Jeannette expedition, and, if not, were they the result of a mystification as above suggested? The first is of course the only one of importance to geographers, for if the relics were spurious, it matters but little whence they were derived. The facts are now in order. 1. The Jeannette sank June 11, 1881, in the Arctic Sea, about 180 miles northwest from the New Siberian Islands. 2. The Greeley Relief Expedition of 1884 reached the coast of Greenland in May. The Bear met the pack ice near Godhaven about May 13. The Thetis and Loch Gerry, May 22. The Alert on June 5th. The latter left Godhaven June 9 and reached Upernivik June 13. 3. On June 18, some Eskimo found on the surface of an ice flow of Julianehaab in southwest Greenland some articles which were turned over to the Danish officer in charge of that settlement, Herr Leitzen, who sent them to a friend in Copenhagen. These comprised, among other things, some broken biscuit boxes, a pair of oilskin trousers, said to have been marked Louis Noros, the name of one of the Jeannette survivors, who was a member of the Greeley Relief Expedition of 1884, and a number of written papers, especially a list of the boats of the Jeannette, and a list of provisions signed by Delong, the commander of the Jeannette Expedition, and stated to be entirely in his or a single handwriting. 4. The Greeley Relief Expedition left Greenland from Godhaven July 9, without touching at Julianehaab. 5. In the latter part of the winter of 1884 through 85, a Danish correspondent wrote to Dr. Emil Bessels, formerly of the Polaris Expedition, and a well-known Arctic expert, at Washington, stating that news of these various relics had been received in Copenhagen, and requesting his opinion as to their authenticity. The substance of this letter was communicated to me by Dr. Bessels, who was much interested in the find, as, if genuine, it obviously furnished important data toward a knowledge of the drift in the polar regions. The presence in Washington during 1885 of many members of the relief expedition, in connection with the various investigations which followed their return, enabled Dr. Bessels to interview many of the seamen as well as their officers, and to accumulate a large mass of notes from his examination of them. On one or two occasions I was invited to be present when some of these men called on Dr. Bessels. The well-known tendency of articles on the surface of ice, under the influence of the sun, to sink through it to the level of the water, even such trifles as birds' feathers or dead leaves being rapidly engulfed, as I have often personally noticed, led to doubts as to the possibility of the articles mentioned having remained on the surface of the ice for three years during a drift of three thousand miles exposed to the elements. 
the possibility of the preservation of written papers under such conditions seemed almost incredible the close approximation of the dates of the presence of the relief expedition on the west greenland coast and that of the finding of the relics was also suspicious the testimony of the seamen interviewed was in brief to the effect that the presence of Jeannette's survivors on the relief expedition had suggested to someone the possibility of producing a sensation in the fleet which for some time followed the foremost vessels that in a spirit of boyish levity this hoax was conceived and carried out with no intention of serious deception or thought of the possible consequences no names were mentioned and the evidence was to the effect that a general impression prevailed among the men that some such prank had been played rather than that any particular man questioned was personally cognizant of the act dr bessels gathered an amount of evidence tending to support this hypothesis which he showed me and which covered forty or fifty pages of fool's cap this record was afterward burned with his library and other papers in a fire which destroyed his residence at glendale d c in consequence dr bessels communicated to his european correspondents his belief that the relics were fictitious and the result of a hoax i stated to dr rink and others who inquired of me the same conclusions six in eighteen eighty eight dr nansen made his celebrated journey across greenland and presumably heard of the relics there before his return dr bessel died in germany where he had taken up his residence up to this time either the doubts which had been thrown on the authenticity of the relics or some other reason had prevented them from exciting much interest and the owner seems to have resisted any attempt to verify their authenticity by sending photographs or originals of the papers to america when requested the papers and other objects were placed in a box in a garret and after the death of the owner were burned as worthless with the acquiescence of the widow as herr leitzen had published an account of them geographie titzgrift eight eighteen eighty five through eighty eight pages forty nine through fifty one and the finder and possessor alike acted in perfect good faith throughout it is probable that after dr bessel's opinion was communicated to him the owner attached no great value to the objects otherwise his wife would hardly have been ignorant of it when dr nansen endeavoured to examine these objects with a view of determining their authenticity they were no longer in existence one of his friends whose name has slipped my memory and whose letter is temporarily inaccessible wrote to me on nansen's behalf as he explained asking my opinion which was sent some time before the starting of nansen's latest expedition baron nordenskjöld was also informed some time before nansen sailed so that there is no doubt that nansen was cognizant of the fact that the authenticity of the relics was seriously questioned he had previously admitted as much in his paper above cited but did not on that account relax his faith in them conclusions it is evident that the proof that the relics were the result of a hoax is not complete and in the nature of things unless the parties actually concerned shall admit it is never likely to be completed each person will form his own opinion from the data submitted i have spent some ten years of my life at sea nearly half of the time in command of a united states surveying vessel and i am quite aware of the nature of sailor men and sailors evidence dr bessels was for years my intimate and valued friend and associate and in all our intercourse nothing ever occurred to lead me to doubt his earnest endeavour to get at the truth of this matter my own conclusions are first that the relics were not authentic and second that they were probably due to a hoax as stated above in support of the first conclusion beside the data given the probability that de long himself would be writing out receipts for stores is very small there has been since eighteen forty eight an average of two or three ships a year lost in the ice north of bering strait and in the vicinity of the point where the jeannette entered the pack not a single relic of all the enormous fleet of over one hundred wrecks has ever been identified on the greenland coast where wood has always been of the greatest value 
driftwood from northern rivers is cast up on the Greenland coast more or less every year, but there is no evidence that it comes from points east of Nova Zembla. It is not impossible that some of it does, but it cannot be proved. Some twenty-odd years ago a throwing stick, of the pattern used at Port Clarence near Bering Strait, came ashore on the coast of Greenland near Godhaab, and was presented to the museum at Christiania by Dr. Rink. When one remembers how the crews of whale ships collect curios which they carry to all parts of the world, and which are often thrown away or lost in the most unexpected places, the certainty that this stick drifted from Port Clarence, a distance of not less than 4,000 miles, is evidently not to be taken for granted. I have received from lagoons on the west side of the peninsula of Lower California, formerly frequented by whalers, marine shells unquestionably of North European origin, Puccinum undatum especially, which is not known in the Pacific at all, and I have also received Indo-Pacific species, as well as coconut shells, collected by John Murdoch, from the shores of the Arctic Ocean, north of Bering Strait. That the drift of the Jeannette was due to the prevalent winds is beyond question, as already shown by Melville, and as may be worked out by anybody from the data. That, if continued, it would have passed across the pole, as argued by Nansen, is a pure assumption, though a very enticing one. Certainly no one interested in Arctic work but must most heartily wish that that courageous explorer may succeed in proving his hypothesis and return in safety to claim the laurels his success would earn. In regard to the second point, that of the origin of the so-called relics, if regarded as fictitious, I have already stated my conclusion that the story of the hoax seems sufficient to account for them. To be perfectly impartial, however, one must admit that the currents about southwest Greenland are such that objects set adrift on the ice from any great distance to the northward of Julianehab would usually be set over to the westward rather than inshore, although this general rule is subject to exceptions due to strong westerly winds. This fact alone, I suspect, was sufficient to satisfy Nansen, whose hypothesis was already framed, but it must be remembered that the Greenland current does not round Cape Farewell with equal strength at all seasons of the year, that the advent of the relief expedition was exceptionally early, the influx into Baffin's Bay had not begun, and that along such a coast as that of Greenland, eddies and reverse currents cannot fail to occur. While not without weight, I cannot assign to Nansen's objection sufficient weight to overcome the other indications, which for me, at least, lead to the conclusion that the so-called Jeannette relics have not been shown to have any certain connection with the Jeannette expedition. Furthermore, there is no certainty that the Alaskan throwing stick was brought to the coast of Greenland by oceanic currents, and even if it was, the time occupied in the transit and the route are alike absolutely unknown, so that speculations as to a drift across the region of the pole receive from this incident no positive confirmation. Admiral Sir E. Inglefield, the distinguished Arctic traveller at the meeting of the Royal Geographical Society, called to discuss Nansen's plans, told of finding a fresh stick of Siberian pine with the bark still upon it and which seemed to have been only a few months in the water on the west shore of Wellington Channel which enters Baffin's Bay from the west. If such a tree could be carried eastward in a few months from Siberia to a point accessible by ships from Baffin's Bay, why is it not more probable that this throwing stick, lost near Port Clarence, was carried north and east by the well-known northeasterly shore current past Point Barrow, and so on to Baffin's Bay and the Greenland coast? At this meeting such Arctic authorities as Admiral Sir George Nares, Captain Wharton, Hydrographer R. N., Ex-Hydrographer Sir George Richards, R. N., and Sir Joseph Hooker united in the opinion that nothing was known about the direction or existence of sea currents in the region Nansen hoped to traverse, and that all opinions in regard to them must be purely speculative. The doubtful character of the so-called Jeannette relics was also distinctly pointed out. 
It cannot be said, therefore, that Nansen pursued his plans in ignorance of the doubtful elements of his hypothesis, but rather that his courage, energy, and audacity were such that he was willing to risk everything to put his speculations to a final test. End of section 1 Section 2 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 7, March 1896. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nansen's Polar Expedition by General A. W. Greeley, Chief Signal Officer, United States Army. The continuing interest of the unsolved polar mystery has been strikingly illustrated by the eagerness with which the press of the world has caught at every word that seems to indicate the success and safety of the brave Norwegian in his dangerous drift voyage toward the North Pole. Dr. Fritjof Nansen, born in 1861, became famous by crossing, first of all men, the inland ice of Greenland in 1888 from Umivik, 64 degrees 45 minutes north on the east coast to Kangersunek Fjord, 50 miles south of Gotab. Later, he conceived a novel and dangerous plan for polar work. Ignoring the accepted rules of ice navigation, of avoiding besetment and following the protected lee of land masses, he decided to put his ship into the ice to the north of the New Siberian Islands, whence he believed that he would be carried by ocean currents across the pole to the Spitsbergen Sea. His steamer, Fram, 125 feet long, with an oak hull 30 inches thick, and sheathed with green heart, was built so as to rise under ice pressure, as he claimed. The crew of twelve were provisioned for five years, though he expected, by a drift of a little over two miles per day, to reach the Atlantic in two years. No explorer of experience endorsed the plan, but with undaunted courage Nansen sailed June twenty fourth, 1893, and entering the Sea of Kara was last seen to the east of Nova Zembla in September 1893. He visited neither the Timor Peninsula nor the New Siberian Islands, as events have since shown. February 13th, 1896, a dispatch from Irkutsk on the authority of Koncharev, an agent of Nansen, stated that the explorer, having reached land masses at the North Pole, was now returning. Two days later, a dispatch from Archangel confirmed the first report in general terms only, from the beginning, no credit was given to these dispatches by any American Arctic explorer or student. Melville, Schutze, Dahl, and the writer were strenuous in disbelief, but the story was credited by scores of persons, both in Europe and this country, who did not find it peculiar that a story from the center of Asia was confirmed from the north of Europe, nor were surprised that such news came from the Siberian Ocean in midwinter. Through the Norwegian press, Nansen's relatives announced their disbelief in this rumor. As to the drift relics found on the west coast of Greenland, which were relied on by Nansen as practical proof that his theory of a drift voyage was correct, it may be said that Melville, the man best qualified to speak about the Jeanette, denied at the time their genuineness and endeavored without avail to have them brought to this country. The writer publicly called Nansen's attention to this question, which for the first time seems to have created doubts in his mind. Nansen made efforts to find the relics for verification, but they had disappeared in toto. While Nansen's journey is exceedingly dangerous, it would not be astonishing if he was able to return from his ship, if it was lost south of 81 degrees north to the Asiatic coast, but if he really approached the North Pole, as is possible, before his vessel was destroyed, it is safe to say that he will pay for an unequalled latitude with his life and carry the secret of his well-earned success to his grave. The numerous errors lately set forth in the press indicate the need of accurate data relative to latitudes attained. 
the tendency to unfairly present data in the interests of individuals or nations is of constant occurrence and it is not surprising that the general public should be unfamiliar with all the facts this is especially true in arctic matters as is shown by the north polar chart in the times atlas 1895 so much lauded for its fullness and accuracy on this chart the highest north of the german swedish and english paris 1827 expeditions is so described in full by text and latitudes in the case of beaumont the english explorer his latitude is given as 82 degrees 54 minutes north which is 33 miles too far north and his record is spread on the map above that of lockwood while the last named explorer who actually made the highest north ever attained has not even his latitude entered in this remarkable case of suppressio veri an american explorer loses his nationality his latitude and his hard-earned record all other nationalities having their data entered in full under these conditions it seems to be rendering a geographical service to reproduce here a table extracted from a handbook of arctic discovery written by myself records of the highest north made since fifteen eighty seven in the eastern and western hemispheres by land and by sea note this table is reproduced by permission of roberts brothers publishers End of note. Eastern Hemisphere. Commander William Barrens. Date July fourteenth, fifteen ninety four. North latitude seventy seven degrees twenty minutes. Longitude sixty two degrees east. Locality near Cape Nassau, Nova Zembla. Commander Riepen Heemskerk, Barrens third voyage. Date June nineteenth, fifteen ninety six north latitude seventy nine degrees forty nine minutes longitude twelve degrees east locality north spitzbergen commander henry hudson date july thirteenth sixteen o seven north latitude eighty degrees twenty three minutes longitude ten degrees east locality spitzbergen sea commander j c phipps date july twenty seventh seventeen seventy three north latitude eighty degrees forty eight minutes longitude twenty degrees east locality spitzbergen sea commander william scoresby date may twenty fourth eighteen o six north latitude eighty one degrees thirty minutes longitude nineteen degrees east locality spitzbergen sea commander w e parry date july twenty third eighteen twenty seven north latitude eighty two degrees forty five minutes longitude twenty degrees east locality spitzbergen sea commander nordenskjold and otter date september nineteenth eighteen sixty eight north latitude eighty one degrees forty two minutes longitude eighteen degrees east Locality Spitzbergen Sea, highest by ship. Commander Weyprecht and Payer. Date April twelfth, eighteen seventy four. North latitude eighty two degrees five minutes. Longitude sixty degrees east. Locality Franz Josef Land by Payer, highest land. Western Hemisphere. Commander John Davis. Date June thirtieth, fifteen eighty seven. North latitude seventy two degrees twelve minutes, longitude fifty six degrees west, locality West Greenland. Commander Henry Hudson, date June twentieth, sixteen o seven, north latitude seventy three degrees, longitude twenty degrees west, locality off East Greenland. Commander William Buffin, date July fourth, sixteen sixteen, north latitude. 77 degrees 45 minutes longitude 72 degrees west locality smith sound commander e a inglefield date august 27th 1852 north latitude 78 degrees 21 minutes longitude 74 degrees west locality smith sound commander e k kane 
date june twenty fourth eighteen fifty four north latitude eighty degrees ten minutes longitude sixty seven degrees west locality cape constitution greenland by morton commander c f hall date august thirtieth eighteen seventy north latitude eighty two degrees eleven minutes longitude sixty one degrees west locality frozen sea commander c f hall date june thirtieth eighteen seventy one north latitude eighty two degrees seven minutes longitude fifty nine degrees west locality greenland by sergeant mayer signal corps u s army commander g s nares date september twenty fifth eighteen seventy five north latitude eighty two degrees forty eight minutes longitude sixty five degrees west locality greenell land by aldrich commander g s nares date may twelfth eighteen seventy six north latitude eighty three degrees twenty minutes longitude sixty five degrees west locality frozen sea by a h markham commander a w greeley date may thirteenth eighteen eighty two north latitude eighty three degrees twenty four minutes longitude forty one degrees west locality new land north of greenland by lockwood and brainard doubtless the name of some whaler should follow that of puffin in the above list but the inexactitude of most high latitudes reported by whalers is well known possibly the reported northing of lambert seventy eight and a half degrees north in sixteen seventy on the east greenland coast may have exceeded inglefield's exact latitude of seventy eight degrees twenty one minutes sweden holds the ship's record in the old world but parry beat it by boats it will be noted that england held the honours of the furthest north through hudson sixteen o seven phipps seventeen seventy three parry eighteen twenty seven and nares by aldrich eighteen seventy five and by markham eighteen seventy six this record unbroken for two hundred and seventy five years passed to the united states through the efforts of the international polar expedition under lieutenant greeley which by lockwood and brainard reached eighty three degrees twenty four minutes the most northerly point whether on sea or land ever attained by man which nansen or jackson may possibly excel among other high latitudes attained but not pertinent to this table are the following hayes about eighty degrees ten minutes in eighteen sixty one jackson eighty one degrees twenty minutes in eighteen ninety five Peary, eighty one degrees thirty seven minutes in eighteen ninety one and eighteen ninety five Bormond, eighty two degrees twenty one minutes in eighteen seventy six Pavey with Greeley, eighty two degrees fifty four minutes in eighteen eighty two and Aldrich, eighty three degrees seven minutes in eighteen seventy six End of section two Section three of the National Geographic Magazine, volume seven, March eighteen ninety six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Submarine Cables of the World by Gustav Hurley. The English gift professor, afterwards Sir Charles Wheatstone, the credit of being the originator of submarine cables, that gentleman having laid before the House of Commons in 1840 a scheme for the laying of a telegraph cable across the channel between Dover and Calais but his plans did not seem to have been fully matured. In the United States, in 1842, Professor S. F. B. Morse experimented with a submarine cable between Castle Garden and Governor's Island, New York Harbor, and a year later, in detailing the results of his experiments with an electromagnetic telegraph in a letter to the then Secretary of the Treasury, J. C. Spencer, he said, The practical interference from this law is that a telegraphic communication on the electromagnetic plan may with certainty be established across the Atlantic. Startling as this may seem now, I am confident that the time will come when this project will be realized. It was not, however, until 1850 that the first submarine cable in the open sea was laid. This was the cable across the channel between Dover and Calais. It was made of copper wire, covered with gutta-percha to half an inch in diameter. 
the shore ends of the wire being doubly covered with cotton, overlaid with a coating of India rubber, and the whole enclosed in a thick lead pipe. This cable did not work successfully, on account of defective insulation, and had to be abandoned. Another authority states that telegraphic communication was maintained for a few hours, when it was suddenly interrupted, the cause being, as was afterwards discovered, the cutting of the cable by a French fisherman, who, it is said, exhibited a piece of it to the astonished people of the neighboring town, as a rare specimen of seaweed, with its center filled with gold. Be that as it may, to guard against such casualties, the new cable, laid in the following year, 1851, between Dover and Calais, was made much stronger, consisting of a wire insulated with gutta percha, and forming a core to a wire rope as a protector. This cable was an entire success, and as a consequence, the establishment of a number of short submarine cables in Europe and America followed shortly afterward. In 1854, Mr. Cyrus W. Field, whose memory will ever be dear to the hearts of Americans, took up, in company with American and English capitalists, the project to connect Europe and America by a submarine cable, and on August 7, 1857, the laying of the first Atlantic cable was begun by the U.S. frigate Niagara, which sailed from Valencia, Ireland, in the direction of Hart's Continent, Newfoundland. When about 400 miles had been laid, the cable broke and the steamer returned. In the following year, 1858, the attempt was renewed. HMS Agamemnon, with one portion of the cable, and the U.S. frigate Niagara, with the other portion, meeting in mid-ocean, in about latitude 52 degrees 2 minutes north, longitude 53 degrees 18 minutes west, to splice the cable there, and then to lay it, one ship sailing eastward and the other westward. In this attempt, the cable broke, and the steamers returned to port, but a sufficient length of the cable being left, another attempt was made later in the year, and the laying was successfully accomplished over the whole distance. America and Europe were united by telegraphic communication on August 5th, and congratulatory messages were exchanged between the two continents. This is what the Queen of England telegraphed to the President of the United States. The Queen desires to congratulate the President upon the successful completion of this great international work, in which the Queen has taken the deepest interest. The Queen is convinced that the President will join with her in fervently hoping that the electric cable which now connects Great Britain with the United States will prove an additional link between the nations whose friendship is founded upon their common interest and reciprocal esteem. The Queen has much pleasure in communicating with the President and renewing to him her wishes for the prosperity of the United States. To this President Buchanan replied as follows, the President cordially reciprocates the congratulations of Her Majesty the Queen on the success of the great international enterprise accomplished by the science, skill, and indomitable energy of the two countries. It is a triumph more glorious, because far more useful to mankind, than was ever won by conqueror on the field of battle. May the Atlantic Telegraph, under the blessing of heaven, prove to be a bond of perpetual peace and friendship between the kindred nations and an instrument destined by divine providence to diffuse religion, civilization, liberty, and law throughout the world. In this view will not all nations of Christendom spontaneously unite in the declaration that it shall be forever neutral, and that its communication shall be held sacred in passing to their places of destination, even in the midst of hostilities. But, alas, the joy over the greatest triumph of the age was destined to be of short duration, in less than a month, the cable refused to work, owing to some fault the nature of which could not be definitely ascertained. It was at last abandoned in despair, and no further attempt to lay another one was made until 1864, when the Atlantic Telegraph Company made, with the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company, a contract for a new cable between Valencia and Hart's Content, and chartered the steamship Great Eastern to lay it. This cable was 2,273 nautical miles long, and its weight was 300 pounds per mile. Its laying down commenced on July 23, 1865, Mr. Cyrus W. Field being on board the ship, but on August 2, after about 1,400 knots had been played out, the cable parted and the broken end disappeared from view. The Great Eastern remained near the scene of the accident until August 11, when she gave up the attempt to recover the cable and returned to Europe. Thus another hope, another aspiration, was buried, 
and we may well imagine the feelings of those who had put their faith and their money into the undertaking. The story of this attempt, and of the successful recovery of the lost cable a year later, by means of grapnels from a depth of over 2,000 fathoms, forms one of the most interesting chapters in the history of submarine telegraphy. But after all the disheartening failures which had attended the laying of the first three Atlantic cables, the indomitable pluck and energy of Mr. Field and his associates were to be finally rewarded with success. A new cable was ordered, and on July 13, 1866, the Great Eastern again started from Valencia, and, without further serious mishap, finished the laying over the whole distance on July 27, when the cable was spliced to the shore's end at heart's content. Moreover, on September 1st following, the Great Eastern recovered the lost cable of the previous year, spliced it to the cable on board, and completed the laying of it towards heart's content, thus establishing a duplicate line. Ever since that time we have had uninterrupted telegraph communication with Europe, and this 1866 cable thus became the pioneer of the long-distance deep-sea cables. Immense progress has since been made in the establishment of submarine telegraph lines. A fleet of between 35 and 40 steamers, specially constructed and equipped for cable service, sprang into existence, and the present total length of the submarine cables of the world is, in round numbers, 160,000 nautical miles, or enough to gird the earth seven and one-half times at the equator. At an average cost of $1,200 per mile, the entire system represents an outlay of $192 million. Of the total mileage, about one-eighth is under the control of various national governments. The Hydrographic Office issued, in 1892, a book on submarine cables, prepared by Mr. G. W. Littlehales, as a part of the report of that office on the survey made by the U.S. ships Albatross and Thetis for an ocean cable route between San Francisco and Honolulu. It contains a large amount of interesting information, including valuable statistical data, among which is a complete list of the submarine cables of the world, in detail. The tables being much too voluminous for publication in these pages, the following list of the more important cables have been compiled from them, the reader being referred to the original report for information concerning the shorter cables and for more complete data generally. Cables over 400 nautical miles long, operated by governments. France, Marseille to Algiers, three cables, 488, 496, and 500. Tenerife to St. Louis, Senegal, 865. Cochin, China, and Tonkin, Cape St. James to Thuan, Hoi, 530. British India, Memorne to Jask, 531. Jask to Bushire, two cables, 519 and 500. Cables over 400 nautical miles long, owned by private companies, also total length of cables operated by each company. Direct Spanish Telegraph Company, total 708, Kennick Cove, Cornwall to Los Arens, near Bilbao, 487. Halifax and Bermuda Cable Company, Halifax, Nova Scotia to Hamilton, Bermuda, 850. Spanish National Submarine Telegraph Company, total 2,159. Cadiz to Santa Cruz de Tenerife, 864. Tejita, Tenerife to St. Louis, Senegal, 865. West African Telegraph Company, total 3,015. Cotun to St. Thomas, 468. St. Thomas to Lonada, 760. Great Northern Telegraph Company, Europe and Asia, total 6,932. Newbiggin, England, to Ariadale, Norway, 424. Newbiggin to Marstrand, Sweden, 510. Newbiggin to Hertzschads, Denmark, 420. Amoy to Gustav, China, 590. Gutsiaf to Nagasaki, Japan, 427. Gutsiaf to Nagasaki, 416. Nagasaki to Vladivostok, Russia, two cables, 753 and 766. Eastern Telegraph Company, total 27,453. Porthcarno, Land's End, England, to Lisbon, Portugal, two cables, 
850 and 802. Porterno to Vigo, Spain, 622. Gibraltar to Malta, two cables, 1118 and 1126. Marseille, France to Bona, Algeria, two cables, 447 and 463. Trista, Austria to Corinne, 593. Malta to Alexandria, Egypt, two cables, 928 and 911. Suez, Egypt to Suakim, Sondon, three cables, 936, 811, and 811. Suez to Aden, 794. Suez to Param Island, 1331. Suakim to Parent Island, 597. Suakim to Aden, two cables, 794 each. Aden to Bombay, three cables, 1850, 1859, and 1885. Eastern and South African Telegraph Company, total 6,796, increased since 1892 to 8,841. Aden to Zanzibar, 1,909. Zanzibar to Mozambique, two cables, 644 and 685. Mozambique to Lorenco Marquet, Delagoa Bay, 970. Cape Town to Port Noleth, 433. Port Nolis to Mosamedes, 1,652. Eastern Extension, Australasia, and China Telegraph Company, total 17,342. Madras to Penance, two cables, 1,462, 1,389. Rangoa to Penance, 864. Singapore to Saigon, Cochin, China, 628. Haiphong, Tonkina, to Hong Kong, 470. Fuchan to Hong Kong, 472. Saigon to Hong Kong, 990. Saigon to Thumban'an, 516. Hong Kong to Cape Belineo, island of Uxoa, 529. Singapore to Batavia, Java, 541. Singapore to Banjuwangi, Java, 921. Banju Wangi to Port Darwin, Australia, two cables, 1,143 and 1,124. Banju Wangi to Roebuck Bay, Australia, 892. Sydney to Nelson, New Zealand, two cables, 1,284 and 1,322. Hong Kong to Fuchan, 472. Fuchan to Shanghai, 449. Anglo American Telegraph Company, total 10,400 increased to 12,290 since 1892. Valentia, Ireland, to Hearts Content, Newfoundland, three cables, 1,850, 1,881, and 1,890. Minoa, France, to Saint-Pierre, 2,718. Saint-Pierre to Duxbury, Massachusetts, 809. Direct United States Cable Company, total 3,099. Balance Kellogg's Bay, Ireland to Halifax, 2,564. Halifax to Rye Beach, New Hampshire, 535. Champagne Francais du Telegraph de Paris, à New York, total 3,496. Brest to Saint Pierre, 2,282. Saint Pierre to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, 826. Western Union Telegraph Company, total 7,743. Penzance, England to Canso, Nova Scotia, two cables. 2,531 and 2,576. Kenzo to New York, two cables, each 888. The Commercial Cable Company, total 6,938, since increased to 9,075. Harve to Waterville, Ireland, 510. Waterville to Kenzo, three cables, 2,138, 2,350, and 2,388. Kenzo to New York, 841. Kenzo to Rockport, Massachusetts, 519. Brazilian Submarine Telegraph Company, total 7,369. Lisbon to Madeira, two cables, 627 and 631. Madeira to St. Vincent, Cape Verde Island, two cables, 1,168 and 1,200. St. Vincent to Pernambuco, Brazil, two cables, 1,862 and 1,872. African Direct Telegraph Company, total 2,746. Santiago to Broadhurst, 471. 
brought hers to Sierra Leone, 463. Sierra Leone to Accra, 1,020. Cuba Submarine Telegraph Company, total 1,590. Cienfiegos to Santiago, Cuba, three cables, 400, 420, and 420. West India and Panama Telegraph Company, total 4,577. Kingston, Jamaica to Cologne, Panama Isthmus, 630. Holland Bay to San Juan, Puerto Rico, 683. Holland Bay to Ponce, Puerto Rico, 647. St. Croix to Port of Spain, Trinidad, 541. Société Française du Telegraphe sous Marius, total 3,754, since increased to 4,544. Porto Plato, Santo Domingo, to Port de France, Martinique, 787. Fort de France, to Paramaribo, Dutch Guinea, 777. Cayenne, to Vinsu, Brazil, 662. Santo Domingo, to Caracho, 453. Western and Brazilian Telegraph Company, total 3,964, since increased to 6,144. Maranham to Sierra, Brazil, 406. Sierra to Pernambuco, 476. Bahá'í to Rio de Janeiro, 837. Mexican Telegraph Company, total 1,523. Galveston, Texas to Tampico, Mexico, 400. Galveston to Coatzarolocos, Mexico, 822. Central and South American Telegraph Company, total 7,496. Salina Cruz, Mexico, to Libertad, Salvador, 431. San Juan del Sur de Panama, 721. Bonaventura to St. Elena, Ecuador, 486. Piata to Caleo Lima, Peru, 553. Caleo Lima to Iquacu, Chile, 747. Iquaque to Valparaiso, Chile, 877. West Coast of America Telegraph Company, total 1,699, since increased to 1,964. Caleo, Lima, to Malendo, Peru, 510. Note on compilation of chart. This chart, see front's piece, was compiled in the U.S. Hydrographic Office from the latest information and is a facsimile of H.O. Chart number 1530, just issued by that office. The 12 cables across the North Atlantic Ocean were plotted from their terminal points on the American continent to meridian 40 degrees west, from positions furnished by the respective cable companies, with the exception of three, the Western Union of 1881 and 1882, and the McKay-Bennett of 1894, for which positions were furnished all the way across. From the European terminal points to meridian 40 degrees west, the cables with the exceptions just mentioned were plotted from information deposited in the Office of Naval Intelligence. A map furnished by the Western Union Telegraph Company was used for the plotting of the principal connecting landlines in the United States. The cables and landlines of Japan were taken chiefly from the outline map of Japan, showing the principal post, telegraph, and railway routes published by the Japanese Department of Communications in 1888, and which accompanies a concise dictionary of the principal roads and chief towns and villages of Japan by W. N. Whitney, M.D., formerly interpreter of the U.S. legation at Tokyo. The other cables and landlines of the world were taken chiefly from the Carte de Communications, Telegraphie du Régime, extra European de Résil du Pré, des Documents Officiels, Pour la Bureau Internationale de Administration Telegraphique, Bern, 1888. The coaling, docking, and repairing stations of the world and their different grades of facilities were compiled mainly from a publication of the Office of Naval Intelligence entitled Coaling, Docking, and Repairing Facilities of the Ports of the World, 1892, and corrections thereto up to December 1895, and from the British Dock Book of 1894. End of section 3。section 4 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 7, March 1896。This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Peter Cooper and Submarine Telegraphy In presenting to its readers a chart of the submarine telegraph cables of the world, the National Geographic magazine was unwilling that this graphic representation of intercontinental communication should be unaccompanied by some reference to one of its earliest and most effective pioneers, the late Peter Cooper. It is well to recall to the rising generation its indebtedness to Mr. Cooper for his eminent services in fostering the initiation of the now elaborate network between the widely separated continents of the earth. With considerable reluctance and only after repeated urging, one of the actors in this great work, the Honorable Abram S. Hewitt, has outlined in a letter all too brief the part played by Mr. Cooper. The letter is as follows. The story of the Atlantic Cable has been so fully and so well told by the Reverend Henry M. Field in his history, published in 1892 by Messrs. Schribner and Sons of this city, that only the briefest outline is necessary to call public attention to the origin of an enterprise which, at the time of its inception, was regarded with incredulity, and whose prosecution and final success have all the elements of a romance. My first knowledge of the enterprise was in 1854, when Mr. Cyrus W. Field invited Mr. Peter Cooper and other gentlemen to listen to the propositions of Frederick N. Gisborne, who had come to New York for the purpose of interesting capital in constructing a line of telegraph across Newfoundland, so as to get the news at Cape Race from the European steamers and transmit it thence overland to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and thence by fast steamers to the Cape of Brenton, whence land lines had been constructed connecting with our American system. In that interview, no suggestion was made for a cable across the Gulf of St. Lawrence, because it was doubtful at that time whether submarine communication of such length could be established and maintained. The amount of money required was not very considerable, and the gentlemen appealed to, being all men of large views, came to the conclusion that they would contribute to the amount, not so much as a commercial speculation, as from consideration of the advantage of early news in business transactions affecting the two continents. The Newfoundland Company was organized, with Mr. Cooper as its president and Mr. Field as its active manager. The other gentlemen concerned in the undertaking were Moses Tyler, Marshall O. Roberts, Chandler W. White, and, at a later period, Wilson G. Hunt. David Dudley Field also took an interest and was legal advisor of the company. Arrangements were made for the construction of the land line without delay, and later, when the experience of the European submarine cables established the practicability of longer lines, it was decided to lay the cable across the Gulf of St. Lawrence, a distance of about 80 miles. The first attempt to lay this cable was a failure, owing to the imperfect arrangements for transporting the cable across the Gulf, and the occurrence of a storm, which caused the severance of the cable when the vessel engaged in laying it was midway between the two termini. It was determined, however, to renew the attempt, and in the following year a cable was successfully laid, and the original plan of the company for intercepting news at Cape Race was carried into effect. As a matter of course, the enterprise was not a commercial success, but its advantages were so apparent that the parties in interest concluded that the time had come to make the attempt to continue the cable from Newfoundland to the coast of Ireland. The idea was a daring one, but the highest electrical authorities concurred in opinion that it was feasible. Mr. Field proceeded to England to organize a company in which he succeeded, and which resulted in the attempt to lay the cable in 1857, made by the Agamemnon on the British side and by the Niagara on the American side. I need not rehearse the story of the successive failures, but the first one occurred in 1857 during the panic of that year, which spread wide ruin throughout the country. Among others, Mr. Field was compelled to succumb, and it seemed probable that any further attempt to construct and lay the cable would be abandoned. It was at this juncture that the strong common sense and unshaken faith of Peter Cooper came into play. When the financial storm had abated, he urged Mr. Field to undertake the resuscitation of the enterprise, and he offered to advance, and actually did advance, the money required for Mr. Field's expenditures 
until such time as the success of the cable might be demonstrated and assured. Some of the other gentlemen declined to participate in these advances, and hence the burden upon Mr. Cooper was very onerous, and gave great concern to his family. Nevertheless, Mr. Field soon recovered his confidence, and with indomitable courage and indefatigable industry, he finally succeeded in accomplishing the difficult undertaking with which his name and fame are justly identified. So far as Mr. Cooper and his family were concerned, they did what they could to secure the success of the enterprise, and I think it may be justly asserted that, without Mr. Cooper's assistance and absolute faith in the final success of the undertaking, its realization would have been postponed for many years. In the end, he was fully indemnified, and perhaps amply rewarded, for his investment, but without detracting in the slightest from the credit which is justly accorded to Mr. Field, I think I am justified in making, at your request, this brief statement in order to show that without the unflinching courage and cooperation of Mr. Cooper, Mr. Field would hardly have been in a position to achieve the triumph which he finally secured, and for which his memory is entitled to the veneration of succeeding generations. End of section 4《セクション5》の National Geographic Magazine、Volume 7、March 1896 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf The Russo-American Telegraph Project of 1864-67 by Professor William H. Dahl the possibility of constructing a line of telegraph overland through Siberia and northwestern America had doubtless occurred to many, but the first person to endeavor to give practical effect to the conception appears to have been Mr. Perry M. Collins of California, who in 1856 and for some years subsequently was United States consular agent at Nikolaevsk on the Amur River in eastern Siberia. By dint of constant activity and perseverance, Mr. Collins succeeded in obtaining the concessions necessary to the construction of the line of telegraph, with all needful accessories, from the Amur to the British Columbian line through eastern Siberia and the Russian-American colonies, and also through the British territories in America. Continual mishaps in the course of the attempts to lay a workable cable across the Atlantic had led many telegraphers to believe that the plan was impracticable, though they had no doubt of their ability to construct and keep in working order shorter lines, such as that proposed across Bering Strait. The propositions of Mr. Collins were laid before the directors of the Western Union Telegraph Company, March 16, 1864. They accepted, by a unanimous vote, the transfer of his rights and interests, and on March 18th completed an organization for the carrying out of the project. An expedition to explore the proposed route, under Colonel Charles S. Bulkley, formerly of the United States Military Telegraph Corps, was immediately organized. Colonel Bulkley reached the Pacific Coast in January 1865. The exploration of the British Columbian line was directed by Edmund Conway, that of the Russian American by Robert Kennicott, and that of Eastern Siberia by Sergius Abasa. The United States detailed Captain C. M. Scammon of the Revenue Marine Service and two other officers to the fleet fitted out by the company, and the Russian government lent the aid of the corvette Vzadnik. The first visit was paid to the Russian authorities at Sitka in March 1865. In July, parties were on the way to Siberia, Alaska, and the Bering Strait. Explorations during this and the following season demonstrated the practicability of the route selected and saw a small amount of line constructed, every endeavor being made to carry out the project. In 1867, the Atlantic cable at last proved itself a working success. On the other hand, the experience gained by the expeditions sent out in connection with the Russo-American project 
showed that the maintenance of the projected line would be so expensive as to make it impossible for it to compete with the Atlantic cable commercially. Consequently, the company decided to withdraw from the enterprise, and in the autumn of 1867, the parties returned to California. The route chosen was up the valley of the Fraser River in British Columbia and down the Yukon to the Nulato Bend, thence across country to Port Clarence, where a cable was to connect with the Siberian lines. The latter would leave the Chukchi Peninsula, cross the neck of the peninsula of Kamchatka, and skirt the shores of the Okhotsk Sea, joining the Russian lines at Nikolaevsk. It is stated that a large part of the 14 millions of dollars represented by the stock was actually expended in the work. At all events, a large amount of money was spent, and the only returns were those public benefits implied by an increase of geographical and other scientific knowledge and the training of a number of explorers and investigators. End of Section 5「United States Geological Survey. The condition of things in Indian Territory is anomalous. The territory is an area of some 31,000 square miles divided among what are called the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, the reservation of each tribe being owned by the tribe. Such a thing as private ownership of land is unknown. Each individual entitled to do so is, however, permitted to take up and occupy any land which is not already occupied, but in so doing he does not acquire title. The population of the territory consists of some 50,000 Indians, a few whites who have married Indian women and have thus acquired membership in the tribe, with the accompanying privileges and emoluments a few thousand negroes mostly the descendants of slaves and a large number variously estimated at from one hundred thousand to two hundred thousand of whites who are living in the territory on sufferance some legally upon the payment of a small tax others without the shadow of right or authority these latter are known as interlopers as might be expected under this condition of affairs the whites who have married Indian women, being much shrewder and more experienced than the Indians, have acquired by the right of occupation nearly all the landed property which is worth having in the territory. They own, if it can be called owning, all the best farming and grazing land, all the timber land which is of immediate value, all the town sites, and all the mineral land which is worth having and by leasing this property to whites they are rapidly acquiring great wealth although in many respects quite advanced in the arts of civilization the governments established by these indians are weak and insufficient so far as the control of the indians themselves is concerned they may have ample power but at present they are called on to cope with and control a large body of whites outnumbering themselves at least three to one, and composed largely of the rough, lawless frontier element. Indeed, were not the tribal governments reinforced by the power of the United States courts, the territory would long ago have been in a state of anarchy. This situation of affairs, instead of improving with time, is rapidly becoming worse, inasmuch as the number of interlopers in the territory is constantly and rapidly increasing the remedy for this threatening aspect of affairs is plainly the substitution of a territorial government by all inhabitants for the present tribal governments of the indian minority the allotment of land to the indians and the consequent establishment of land titles 
foreseeing the necessity of this solution congress has for the past two years been endeavoring to treat with the tribes to accept their lands in severalty in pursuance of this object two different commissions have been appointed each of which has spent several months in the territory endeavoring to obtain a hearing from the tribes but thus far without the slightest result the tribes have declined absolutely to treat with them upon this subject during the progress of these attempts at negotiation congress has taken another step in the same direction in march eighteen ninety five an appropriation of two hundred thousand dollars was made by congress for commencing the survey and subdivision of the lands of the territory being the necessary preliminary step toward allotment this work was placed by the secretary of the interior in the hands of the director of the geological survey instead of being let out on contract as has been done in all cases of subdivision heretofore the chickasaw nation was accepted as it was subdivided in eighteen seventy three the work was commenced in april under the following plan the indian baseline which forms the baseline of the chickasaw nation and of oklahoma was adopted for carrying the work into the other nations the second guide meridian east of the principal meridian of the chickasaw nation was run northward and southward as a principal meridian for the other nations thus while the general system of surveys conforms to that in the chickasaw nation and in oklahoma the work has been so planned as to make it independent of any errors which may have accumulated in the earlier work two parties have been engaged continuously since april last in running standard lines guide meridians and correction lines by which the country is divided into blocks twenty four miles on a side the township exteriors were run by distinct parties two parties being at first organized for this work which were subsequently increased to four the subdivision of townships into sections was carried on by still a third set of parties eight of which were organized and placed in the field during the month of may and the number was subsequently increased to sixteen thus the entire work of subdividing the land is carried on by three distinct sets of parties the work of each checking that of another furthermore a system of triangulation has been carried over the area subdivided and the stations in this triangulation have been connected with section and township corners this is done not only for the purpose of checking and correcting errors but also to form reference points for the recovery of missing corners the triangulation points being marked in a very permanent manner the triangulation rests upon a baseline measured on the track of the missouri kansas and texas railway near savannah and the astronomical position of this place was determined as the initial position the subdivision parties by which is to be understood the parties engaged in running the section lines are grouped four of them being in charge of an experienced surveyor connected with the permanent corps of the united states geological survey who supervises the work closely and attends to the executive management of the outfit and who moreover commonly with the aid of an assistant maps the topography of the area subdivided this latter duty is rendered light by the fact that the surveyor in running the lines locates the points of crossing of every stream road or other natural or artificial feature which he encounters in the course of his line thus at intervals of a mile or less all the features are located and little remains for the topographer to do except to sketch these features between these points of location the progress made in this survey up to the end of january of the present year is set forth in a report which has been made to the secretary of the interior it appears from this that in the primary triangulation forty-nine stations have been selected signals built upon them and angles measured from them by means of these stations an area of about ten thousand square miles or about five twelfths of the area of the territory excluding the chickasaw nation 
has been controlled. In the subdivision work, 11,770 miles had been run out of an estimated amount of 47,000 miles to complete the territory, or about one-fourth of the entire work. Of the above mileage, 970 miles are of standard lines, that is, standard parallels and correction lines. 1,790 miles are exterior lines of townships, 8,770 miles are section lines, and the remaining 240 miles are the meander lines of streams. The work thus far done completes the subdivision of 128 full townships and 26 fractional townships. It is included mainly in the western part of the Choctaw Nation, embraces all of the Seminole country and some of the Creek country, while standard lines have been run into the Cherokee Nation. The progress is represented upon the sketch map accompanying this paper. The mapping of topography has followed closely after the work of subdivision, and up to the date given above, an area of 4,200 square miles had been thus mapped. End of section 6「Section 7 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 7, March 1896. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Free Bergs in the United States. Note by James H. Blodgett late special agent of census in charge of education three bridges across the potomac river connect the district of columbia with the state of virginia the upper one known as the chain bridge just below the little falls the head of tidewater is too far from dense population to be frequented by foot passengers three miles below the chain bridge is the aqueduct bridge practically the head of navigation, since only small pleasure boats and scows to bring stone from the quarries go above it. Along the Virginia shore, above the aqueduct bridge, are various resort houses, more or less permanent, ostensibly for legitimate relaxation and pleasure, but viewed with suspicion by the authorities on both sides of the river, justified by results of occasional raids by officials. At the Virginia end of the same bridge is a straggling group of houses known as Roslyn, a favorite place for those who want to go beyond the police restraints of the District of Columbia, and particularly for those interested in the gambling device known as policy, a sort of lottery especially attractive to the colored people. Between the Aqueduct Bridge and the Long Bridge, two miles or more farther down at the upper extreme of dense habitation the low ground on the virginia side is brushy with but few houses and is a rambling place for various kinds of boys and men who find the towpath of the abandoned canal a convenient footway the highlands contain the government reservation comprising fort myer and the arlington national cemetery Close to the Virginia end of the historic Long Bridge are a few houses known as Jackson City. Freedom from rigid police control has made this a convenient place for gambling in various forms. Close by, known as Alexander's Island, is maintained irregularly a race course. Three miles farther is another race course known as St. Asaph. Note. This article written for the National Geographic magazine, is less technical and has less of legal citation and quotation of authorities than a paper bearing the same title read before the Anthropological Society of Washington, November 5, 1895. The latter, valuable for purposes of reference and verification, will be printed by the American Historical Association. End note. A good part of the racing in sight of the capital has been that known as outlaw racing, 
that is with horses or with jockeys not in good standing with the regular racing associations just below st asaph is the city of alexandria which is popularly regarded as a part of alexandria county to share whatever of good or bad repute attaches to it at the census of seventeen ninety all this vicinity was part of fairfax county except that alexandria already had a separate court and was exempt from county taxes for the organization of the district of columbia virginia ceded to the general government the jurisdiction note over a tract bounded by the line extending ten miles northwest from the mouth of hunting creek a line northeast from the terminus of the first and the river containing an area said to be thirty two square miles in eighteen hundred one congress erected the area ceded by virginia into a county to be called alexandria county but expressly retaining for alexandria all existing chartered rights in eighteen forty six the united states reseeded the tract to virginia which has continued to be generally known as alexandria county though the policy of separation of city and county suspended for half a century has been renewed the combined population of city and county in eighteen ninety was eighteen thousand five hundred ninety seven of which fourteen thousand three hundred thirty nine persons were in the city of alexandria which is not a part of alexandria county although its name its vicinity its recent affinity with the county and the presence of the county buildings note tend with most persons to make the residents municipally responsible for the unlawful conduct nearby many persons while rejoicing in the measure of success attained do not see why the energetic governor of virginia sent officers to break up disreputable practices in the county they do not appreciate the weakness of the real alexandria county when the gambling elements of the neighboring cities flow out upon it it has but a little over four thousand population eighteen ninety of whom after deducting one hundred sixty four on the military reservation over one half two thousand one hundred twenty three are of negro descent and not yet of much proprietary responsibility alexandria is but an example of the cities of virginia from the earliest days james city better known as jamestown and now extinct was established as the chief city in sixteen thirty nine williamsburg was set apart as a city to be used for no other purpose whatever and defined as the capital in sixteen ninety nine and again in seventeen hundred five in advance of population note one the ownership remained in the existing proprietors certain authors erroneously state that the title or possession was transferred note two a bill is pending for erection of county buildings outside of the city end of notes there was a general plan to put in each county a similar town for commercial purposes especially for warehousing and marketing tobacco norfolk chartered as a borough in seventeen thirty seven has lost that name but its relations to the county are today like those of the original charter gradually defined strengthened and confirmed in points of dispute in favor of the municipality at first the norfolk county buildings were in norfolk and a special clause in the charter reserved proprietary rights in them to the county later legislation authorized their sale and the erection of county buildings outside of norfolk the buildings are now in portsmouth in seventeen seventy six many boroughs which had been given separate representation in the assembly were cut off by a law which prescribed that no borough with a population less for seven successive years than half that of any county should be separately represented in the same year the delegate for william and mary college specified in its charter was cut off in the state law for apportionment of members of congress eighteen ninety two the following names of cities are given separate from names of counties first district fredericksburg second norfolk portsmouth and williamsburg third richmond and manchester 
fourth petersburg fifth danville and the town of north danville sixth lynchburg radford and roanoke seventh charlottesville and winchester eighth alexandria ninth bristol tenth stanton to these are to be added buena vista in the tenth district chartered on the day of the approval of the apportionment bill and newport news for which the bill was signed january eighteenth eighteen ninety six the conditions for the town of north danville are in transition it has been a town independent of pittsylvania county but judicially dependent on danville the name has recently been changed to neopolis and just too late for insertion here it will be determined by popular vote whether it shall be consolidated with danville Note. in early days there was a disposition in certain other colonies to establish cities independent of counties in new jersey and in maryland such early independencies as survived came under county control in pennsylvania the claims of germantown to independence of the taxation of philadelphia county were overruled by the governor in virginia from the incorporation of james city sixteen thirty nine it has been the steady policy to have the cities independent of the counties note by popular vote on february twentieth neopolis is to become a part of danville on july first eighteen ninety six and note it confuses some students to find an occasional participation of urban residents and rural residents in local affairs but on examination of charters it will be found that this extends only to subjects expressly named in any instance if one will examine the scheme of government for the city and county of st louis missouri eighteen seventy six he will find that all power of county officers was abrogated the same act restored their power for the rural portion now st louis county leaving the city to be provided with a separate government in the same act the situation in virginia may be clearer if the legislature is deemed to have abolished all county authority in any city under consideration and then to have restored by name such items of power as circumstances demanded the present cities of virginia have the following characteristics the code defines a city as a town having over five thousand inhabitants and a hustings court and defines a town as an incorporated town having less than five thousand population note the cities have distinct courts their citizens do not pay county taxes on city property they do not serve on county juries deeds and other papers affecting city property are recorded by city officers and not by county officers generally residents of cities do not participate in county elections exceptionally they may hold county offices more exceptionally they may vote for county officers generally city police courts have jurisdiction one mile beyond corporate limits exceptionally there is a limited concurrent jurisdiction of city and county courts as over waters adjacent to the cities of norfolk and portsmouth and to norfolk county generally the county and the city have each a set of public buildings within their respective borders exceptionally authority is given to a county for buildings in a city as when at the chartering of the city of manchester chesterfield county was authorized to continue to use its public buildings therein till other arrangements could be made this authority sometimes embraces arrangement for joint occupancy as when norfolk county was authorized to arrange with the city of portsmouth for the location and construction of a jail generally a county officer may not serve writs in a city note the venerable city of williamsburg has a smaller population but its site is expressly set apart for a city End note. exceptionally he can serve writs in the city on residents of his county as witnesses may be summoned for campbell county in the city of lynchburg except for individually specified purposes county and city are as distinct as two counties 
the city of newport news virginia was organized january twentieth eighteen ninety six under a charter naming officers to serve till july the charter contains the following paragraph one fifteen the city of newport news its real and personal property and other subjects of taxation and its inhabitants shall be exempt from all assessments and levies in the way of taxes imposed by the authorities of warwick county for any purpose whatever except upon property owned in the said county by the inhabitants of said city from and after the first day of january eighteen hundred and ninety six nor shall said inhabitants be liable to serve upon juries or work upon roads in said county except in such cases as are provided for by the laws of the state this extract states an exemption of residents in cities from county taxes and from duty on county juries prevalent in the state the present facts regarding the cities of virginia are little known beyond the state the congressional directory is conspicuous as a public document out of the state that shows the cities separately the civil service commission has found it necessary to recognize the certificate of an officer of a city court of record for baltimore st louis and the cities of virginia where a certificate from a county court was contemplated a list of cities in virginia paying no county taxes occurs in the report of the tenth census eighteen eighty volume seven page one hundred seventeen ordinarily in this country a city is part of a county it is set apart that a dense population may establish new values and impose new taxes to meet special demands for public welfare it continues to pay county taxes the difficulty of harmonious action by sparse and dense populations upon subjects common to them has led to exceptional separation of cities from counties baltimore maryland by successive steps culminating in eighteen twenty three and st louis missouri through popular vote in eighteen seventy six these two instances are explained in the johns hopkins university studies in historical and political science local institutions of maryland in volume three and city government of st louis in volume five the latter being most minute and constituting a monograph in itself and yet the existence of cities independent of county control and of county taxes is denied in certain histories and works on civil government used in high schools colleges and universities in many states the administration of the public schools is largely through municipalities charged with that work and superimposed upon areas occupied by other municipalities charged with other interests there is a very general tendency to charter school districts independent of the town in the north or of the county at the south in some states this method of enabling a community to do what the larger unit of which it has been part is not ready to do bids fair to increase this form of legislation is more common in the west and south than in the northeast the forms which these educational municipalities assume are numerous and the complications produced are often intricate the complications are probably most intricate in those states formed of the public domain which have township organization a modified form of the town government of new england it will be most convenient to limit illustration to the organizations which possess taxing powers disregarding subdivisions made simply for details of administration of a larger unit like a voting precinct as a division of a county without taxing power national state and county taxes bear upon property owners throughout the country with the exception of county taxes in st louis baltimore and cities of virginia as already explained the national taxes are so largely collected on goods in bulk before their distribution that most consumers either do not recognize them 
or persuade themselves that somebody else pays them. Below the county tax come the multitudes of variations. The Congressional Township of the Land Survey, six miles square, in its simplest organization, became a school township, a plan encouraged by the grant to the state of a section or of two sections or square miles in a township for school purposes. This school corporation is often subdivided into districts, each with its taxing power. There are instances of superimposed incorporation of the town as a high school district with taxing power. Turning from school administration, we find the same area made a civil township, with care of roads, the poor, and other subjects. Within this township may grow up a compact body of population to be chartered as a village, a town, or a city, according to circumstances, with taxing power for police and other purposes. In some instances, like Springfield, Illinois, these units will assume the charge of schools. In others, like Aurora, Illinois, the city does not administer the schools which remain under the districts into which the school township was divided. A citizen may therefore find himself under three sets of taxes for schools, the township and the district for common schools, and the high school township for its specialty. He may have in addition the civil township tax and the corporation tax. When the school district is given a charter, making it independent of its town, the succession of taxes is modified. A volume would hardly suffice to instance all the variations and combinations of duties of the taxpayer in different states or even in different parts of the same state, growing out of the separately chartered taxing powers and their limited independencies. The cities of Washington, D.C., which has practically absorbed Washington County and become identified with the District of Columbia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New York, Brooklyn, January 1, 1896, New York, New Orleans, Louisiana, coextensive with Philadelphia, New York, and Kings Counties, and Orleans Parish, respectively, but continuing to exercise some functions of counties, and San Francisco, California, identical with San Francisco County, represents simply a growth by which cities have filled county boundaries and not an independence of counties. End of Section 7 Section 8 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 7, March 1896. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Geographic Literature, Obituary Miscellanea. The receipt at a somewhat late hour of two important articles published in this number of the magazine has necessitated the holding over until April of the entire Department of Geographic Literature. Obituary General John Gibbon, a distinguished officer and gallant soldier, died in Baltimore February 6th, graduating at the United States Military Academy in 1847, he rose to be a brigadier general in the regular army and a major general of volunteers. Alike against the Seminoles in Florida and the Nez Perce and Sioux in the Northwest, in the Mexican War and in the War for the Union, he served with conspicuous gallantry, winning distinction whether he was in command of a regiment, a brigade, a division, or an army corps. The most desperate battles of the Army of the Potomac found him at the front, and he was severely wounded both at Fredericksburg and Gettysburg. As a man, General Gibbon was greatly respected, and the National Geographic Society deplores in his death the loss of a valuable member, who in the course of forty-five years of active service had gained a practical knowledge of the geography of the United States, such as few men have the opportunity of acquiring. Miscellanea 
No one unacquainted with Professor W. H. Dahl's earlier work as an explorer would imagine from the reading of his modest article on pages 110 and 111 that he himself bore an important and honorable part in one of the expeditions to which he refers. To all, however, except the younger generation, this fact is well known, as is the further fact that Professor Dahl's continued explorations and researches in Alaska and the North Pacific Ocean for the long period of thirty years have led to his recognition as one of the best informed men of the time on all matters relating to that most interesting and increasingly important section of the globe after the abandonment of the overland telegraph project in eighteen sixty seven mr dahl remained for some time in russian america witnessing its transformation into alaska as the result of its purchase by the united states on his return he published numerous articles of great scientific value and in eighteen seventy appeared his well-known work on alaska and its resources as an assistant in the u s coast survey from eighteen seventy one to eighteen seventy four he devoted himself largely to alaskan studies making repeated visits to the far north and publishing from time to time the results of his investigations concerning it in eighteen eighty four he joined the u s geological survey of which he has since remained an officer he is also closely identified with the smithsonian institution of which he is an honorary curator the proposal to establish a permanent directorship in chief of scientific bureaus and investigations in the department of agriculture to give coordination and continuity to the many-sided scientific work of the department and to complete the good work done by the present secretary in protecting the scientific force from the onslaught of the political spoilsmen has excited great interest in the scientific world and called forth a very notable expression of favorable opinion from a large number of eminent scientists and scientific educators within a brief period in fact since february eighteenth president gilman and the faculty of johns hopkins president dwight and the scientific faculty of yale president sherman of cornell president lowe of columbia president adams of wisconsin president francis a walker of the boston institute of technology dr shaler dean of the lawrence scientific school at harvard dr john s billings of new york the joint commission of the scientific societies of washington and the presidents and other officers of various state universities and colleges have given the proposal the very strongest endorsement while the recommendation is scarcely likely to be favorably acted upon at the present session of congress it is too obviously a step in the direction of a more effective and at the same time more economical administration too manifestly in the interest of good government in general for its adoption to be long delayed a preliminary announcement of the mexican census of eighteen ninety five gives a total population of twelve million five hundred forty two thousand fifty seven as against nine million nine hundred eight thousand eleven at the census of eighteen seventy nine and eleven million six hundred thirty two thousand nine hundred twenty four as officially estimated in eighteen eighty nine the population of the principal cities is said to be as follows city of mexico three hundred thirty nine thousand nine hundred thirty five puebla ninety one thousand nine hundred seventeen guadalajara eighty three thousand eight hundred seventy san luis potosi sixty nine thousand six hundred seventy six monterey fifty six thousand eight hundred thirty five merida fifty six thousand seven hundred two pachuca fifty two thousand one hundred eighty eight durango forty two thousand one hundred sixty six and zacatecas forty thousand twenty six end of section eight end of the national geographic magazine 
Volume 7, March 1896.